Ladies and gentlemen, the Champions League is back. And is it back with a bang? What a night of Champions League football we just got done finished watching. Real Madrid playing Manchester City, which is rapidly becoming the most anticipated game in European football at the moment, right? I mean, we talk about El Clasico of the past. That rivalry doesn't really hold the same weight in terms of quality that we see on the pitch these days. Man City, obviously, that rivalry of United. <laughs> rivalry may be a name alone. It hasn't been really a, a battle between two equal-footed teams in over a decade, right? But with these two teams, I mean, their third meeting in a row, three seasons in a row that they've played. And whether you like the result or not between the two of them, pff, they put on a show. And then obviously on the other hand, you had Arsenal hosting Bayern Munich. Arsenal playing their first Champions League knockout game in I think six, seven years. Playing against Bayern Munich, a team that they really need to exert <laughs> past demons on that, that have caused them so many nightmares in the past. And we were treated to a brilliant game of football as well, too. I think a lot of people went into that game maybe looking at both sides' form heading into this fixture that Arsenal were the overwhelming favorites. And in a way, they were, right? Like, they are the better coach team, in my opinion, throughout this season. They do play better, in my opinion. You could argue in certain positions, Arsenal definitely has a lot more quality in certain positions. But this game was a lot more even than I think people expected. And I think people deserve to be kind of giving Bayern a bit more credit uh, going to the second leg because look regardless of the form that they're in this is still a team that has top european pedigree a lot of these players have either won the champions league or gone far into this competition this was a team that even last year they got beat by a brilliant manchester city team but i'm of the actual opinion that thomas tuchel coached a, a good game in my opinion both those legs and i think individual quality mixed with individual mistakes from Bayern probably hurt them I, thomas tuchel in his own right is one of the best european knockout managers we have on offer in this game. So I definitely think there has to be a lot more credit given to him ahead of the second leg uh, at the Allianz Arena. But let's stick with the Real Madrid Man City game. Look, I try to be objective as I can, no matter what, in my in my analysis and my criticism, but I'm gonna be very honest with you guys as well too. When I watch Champions League football, first of all, I remember growing up watching Champions League on European nights and hearing the the the, the English commentators. You always heard that you felt you got the impression that they were like cheering on the other team, right? Like when the other team scores, you'd hear like a commentator go, get in! And like, it don't matter who they support, but when English teams play on Champions League nights, it almost feels like the whole broadcast company like banks behind that team. And even when they concede, you almost hear like the commentator a little gutted that they concede. Again, no matter who they support. Me as a, as a kid, maybe it was also because of my dad, because my dad hates every other English team outside of United. Like he's a lot more tribalistic in that sense than me. He was always rooting for the English teams to lose in Europe when it's not United. Whether it's Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, City later on, he's always hoping they lose no matter who they play against. And I guess that kind of rubbed off on me because I'll be honest, guys, last night I was supporting Real Madrid and I was supporting Bayern Munich as if I'm born in Munich and Madrid. But I think that that, that Madrid versus Man City game, look, before, the, before I even say anything, I predicted Bayern to advance past Arsenal. I predicted Man City to advance past Real Madrid. And I think at this current moment, both those predictions are in pretty strong stead to, to, to come true. But let's look at the Madrid game first and foremost. A minute into the game, it's an absolute nightmare of a start for Real Madrid. Uh, Chouameni getting a yellow card. He was one of four players along with Camavinga, Bellingham, and Vinicius that if they got a yellow card in this game, they'd be suspended for the return leg. Chouameni within a minute already <laughs> deciding his destiny for, for game two. Yeah, Chouameni already deciding his destiny for the second leg and... <sighs> That's a massive loss. Because one thing that was different about this Real Madrid City game to last year, especially at the Etihad, is the physicality and the legs that Real Madrid had in midfield today. Last year, they came to the uh, Etihad with Toni Kroos and Luka Modric in midfield. And they played Camavinga on the left and Chouameni didn't start that game. And as brilliant as City were technically, tactically, physically, they ran Real Madrid off the pitch. Toni Kroos and Luka Modric could not cope with the City press with the speed and the athleticism at which City were playing, whether it was Bernardo Silva, Kevin De Bruyne, Gundogan, Rodri, they physically dominated them. This year, Ancelotti learned his lesson and he put Chouameni at center back, obviously because of the injury problems that they've been having. Ferlo Mendy at left back in the midfield. You had Kamavinga, you had Fede, and you had Toni Kroos. And this game, City could cope in the midfield, at least again, from a physical point of view. But that Chouameni suspension is massive for them, man. Honestly, like I think any of those four players that I named in Vinicius, Bellingham, Kamavinga, and Chouameni, a suspension would have been detrimental. But Chouameni is a big one, man, for sure. And Bernardo Silva scores the free kick past Lunin, who's had such a good season. But a moment for the second goalkeeper to kind of look away in disgust because that was a moment moment that he should have been stopping and one that I think at the time we were thinking, uh-oh, could this be Man City putting their, their foot on the neck, putting their foot on the accelerator and kind of, just like last season, cruising through to the next round. But give credit to Real Madrid. The first 10 minutes, you could tell there were nerves, especially from a shaky start. But once they got back in the game, 
they got back in the game. And the transition threat of Vinicius and Rodrigo with Jude Bellingham was so much so, and especially with the absence of Kyle Walker's recovery pace in behind, that Real Madrid found luck getting in behind Manchester City so many times in that first half. And look, they got two goals. One of them is Kamavinga, a bit of a deflection. The other one is Rodrigo, where he gets sent through on goal with Diaz and Akanji kind of trying to sandwich him. And he does such a brilliant job of protecting the ball first and foremost. But then also on the finish, some people will say, oh, it's a deflection. Some people will say, oh, Ortega could have done better. Maybe both are true. But Rodrigo does something so brilliant that Rooney used to do really well. Kane does really well these days. Mbappe, in my opinion, does better than anyone. But that's positioning the defender between the ball at your feet and the goalkeeper so that he directly blocks the goalkeeper's eyesight. The goalkeeper is really guessing because Akanji is right in front of him. And Rodrigo does such a brilliant job of that. Puts the kind of slots the ball. Yes, it takes a deflection off Akanji, which makes it even more difficult for Ortega. But Ortega's eyesight, his, his line of view is completely blocked and he doesn't see the ball until it goes past him in the goal. And Rodrigo, I thought, had a really good game, man, honestly. Uh, between him and Vinicius, that's always a natural comparison. But I think they both offer you something different, really. Vinicius is like this transition monster. He's this player with the ball at his feet that can come up with moments of absolute brilliance. And I think at his best, he's more explosive and I think he's more capable of the extraordinary. And for that reason, you might prefer him. But I also do think there are moments and there are instances where you do prefer Rodrigo and that's in the more intricate pockets in the in the kind of half spaces in between midfield and attack especially coming off the left I think Rodrigo is a lot better than he is coming off the right in the last few games we've kind of seen him given that liberty to either start from the left or at least drift from the left and that's where for me you get the best out of him whether it's in the number 10 whether it's on the left whether it's even as a false nine I think you just get so much more from Rodrigo and I was I was really impressed with him but Vinicius and Bellingham I can't lie this is a game for me that they will want to forget and forget quickly Vinicius this is this is for me the catch 22 of Vinicius. He's one of the best players in the world, no doubt about it. Like top five, arguably. But he is a frustrating player, right? He is a high risk, high reward player, just like the layouts, just like even Mbappe to a sense, right? Like they are going to try things over and over and over. And a lot of times it's probably not going to work out, but you live with it because that one time it does work out, or with the best players, obviously, it's one, two, three times that moment is just world class. And I don't think that moment came for Vinicius today. Obviously on any given day, he can give you that moment. But I thought today he was very frustrating because he was trying off a lot of things that weren't kind of coming off. Went through on goal a few times where maybe a more experienced head, maybe a more collected finisher probably puts the game out of sight for Real Madrid. And then Jude Bellingham, I just think, was very quiet today. Had a few nice touches. Bellingham is really good, in my opinion. Like, one of his best attributes is really protecting the ball, holding guys off, and then kind of like a little back heel or a little flick to, to send a, an ongoing fullback or something like that. And he did that a few times, to be fair to him. But that impact in the attacking third that kind of makes the good players go to great that we've seen from Bellingham so much this season, I think, was missing a little bit. And you could see as well, too, he was frustrated because Bellingham and Vinicius' game, let's not forget as well, too, is kind of reliant at times on trying the line between emotional and calm and collected, right? They play at their best when they're allowed to be aggressive and they're allowed to kind of be full throttle and when they're allowed to kind of wear their heart on their sleeve. I think I think that's a fair a fair analysis. And this was a game where both Bellingham and Vinicius uh, had to kind of keep that kind of emotion in them because they know one yellow card and you're out for the second leg. And I think that was definitely something Ancelotti told them. But both of them will have to be a lot better in that, in that second leg because today Real Madrid had time and time and time opportunity to put this game out of reach. 2-1 up, that's a dangerous scoreline. A third one would have put the game out of sight and it would have sent them to the Etihad with a massive advantage. At like real hope of advancing. But that third goal never came. They had chance after chance after chance. And when you don't bury, when you don't punish a team like uh, Manchester City, they'll come up right on the other end and punish you themselves. And that's what they did. Two moments of individual brilliance. First off from Phil Foden, who is making this goal his kind of trademark, to be honest with you, right? Cutting in from the left, being able to kind of trap the ball and immediately release it and then strike it. And the goals are just hit with such ferocity. He has really taken the season on like a personal mission and, and really becoming the guy at times that Manchester City look to when they need a moment of inspiration. It happened against City. It happened against Villa. It's happened against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu. The stage doesn't get much better than that, much bigger than that. And from an individual point of view, I'm very happy for Phil Foden, man, because I, the growth that he's shown this season and his personal development, both mentally and on the ball as well, too. You want to see in the Champions League the best players take their moments and kind of grab that stage. I always say the league for me is more an indication of who the best manager is, who the best squad is. But the Champions League, those fine knockout rounds, those fine details that kind of separate great teams are always the individual moments of brilliance. We saw it in the past with Messi. 
We've seen it time and time with Cristiano Ronaldo, and we're starting to see that from Phil Foden. So I was super happy for him from an individual point of view. But the minute City got that goal, it was like punch in the face to, to Real Madrid. Real Madrid, if you compare this to a boxing match, Real Madrid were in the fight. They were kind of getting the jabs. They were kind of punching Manchester City's body. But that Foden goal was an uppercut to the jaw, and it shocked Madrid. And for five to ten minutes after that, I think Madrid were too stunned to play. And that's when Man City got their footing back on the game. Already in possession, they were they were doing their thing. Man City are always going to dominate Real Madrid in possession. No doubt about it. But they were kind of kept quiet. Once that Foden goal came in, Madrid couldn't play anymore. The, the transition threat didn't exist. They seemed like they were chasing shadows. And the, the third goal is, again, another moment of individual brilliance. First off, Grealish, who I thought was arguably City's player of the game. I thought he was brilliant on the day. Let me know what you guys think about that in the comments. Finds uh, kind of Bates Carvajal. Bates Carvajal, that's Grealish's game, right? He's so good at baiting multiple defenders. Finds Gvardiol, who's cutting in from left wing back, uh, left back, who I also thought Gvardiol had a great game. And then Gvardiol, with one touch inside, curls it into the far corner off his right. A complete, again, stunner out of nowhere for Manchester City. It wasn't like your typical well-worked Pep Guardiola goal, 50 passes into a tap-in. But again, in the Champions League, you need these individual moments of brilliance. And Gvardiol, who has been so criticized this year, in my opinion, quite harshly, right? Has he lit up the world? No, for a player of his price tag, he hasn't. But I think as well, too, people are trying to hit him with this price tag too much because he hasn't been bad either. He's had really good moments for City. Has he been excellent, like out of this world? No, but I think there's enough to see there and work with to think, yeah, another season under Pep, he's going to continue growing. He's still a young kid, by the way, right? I think he's what, 21? He's going, I don't want to, don't, don't put me on that. He's 21, 22 years old. He's only going to continue getting better and better. And I think the physical skill set, like he is an insane athlete mixed with how good on the ball he actually is as well too. I think City have yet again signed one of the best prospects in Europe. But forget about Guardiol, that goal made it three to the Man City. And at this point, I was starting to worry for Real Madrid because one more goal from City, the tie was over, right? If Madrid, if City go back to the Etihad had 4-2 up, you might as well not even play the second leg. Even 3-2 though, look man, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. So City needed to get back to the Etihad with at least a draw. And they needed a goal, they needed a hero. In that moment, that, that hero, that goal, came for, in my opinion, one of their best players on the night, Fede Valverde. For me, this guy is one of the most underrated players in Europe. And I say that because, look, his game is not as flashy as a Vinny or a Rodrigo. His game is not as like, I don't know, smooth as a Tony Cruz. But in my opinion, every team needs a Fede Valverde. Just somebody who knows their role. He's not very flashy. He's a pretty simple player in terms of he just does the fundamentals exceptionally well. Has this incredible motor on him. Very good athlete. Amazing strike on him. Can carry the ball. Makes the pass when he needs to. Dribbles when he needs to. Fills, fills in at right back when Carvajal overlaps. I just think he's the ultimate team player. And I think he's so underrated. Him and Kamavinga, in my opinion, had an exceptional game. And the third goal comes from, again, one of those Vinny moments that, like I said, he will be frustrating, but give him one moment and he will deliver. The cross to the back post evades, I think, about three players. And it just falls beautifully to Fede, who kind of slices the, 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 his body over, like, across the, uh, the ball and side volleys it into the bottom of the corner uh, bottom of the net excuse me ortega has absolutely no chance it was a brilliant brilliantly taken goal from Fede Valverde and that got Real Madrid the third goal that they needed and now look they're going back to the Etihad 3-3 will it be easy absolutely not you're going to the Etihad which in my opinion right it gets a lot of flack for how loud the atmosphere is in the Premier League but one thing you can never take away from it is in the Champions League the Etihad gets popping bro the Etihad bounces in the Champions League man like that's one of the best grounds in Europe recently like they've kind of, in my opinion they've built a, a good reputation in Champions League games that's going to be a tough place to go to De Bruyne will be back and that's the thing I think that's the scary thing for Madrid right City in my opinion didn't play that well tonight I didn't think they were good tonight all three of their goals came from either like for me a freak free kick and then two goals of individual world-class brilliance but like they didn't really play their best game they didn't really rip Real Madrid apart and I think that's the concerning thing they didn't do that and they still got a 3-3 now if they actually click and to be fair City haven't clicked that many times against the big teams this year but if they do at the Etihad it could be a long day for, for Real Madrid and I think this was really a missed opportunity from them like so many chances to just bury City and give themselves that advantage going back to the Etihad and they failed to do it for that reason I think the tie still lays in in, in City's hands man and I think look if after next Next week, Real Madrid are the ones going home and City are going to another semifinal of the Champions League. Madrid will be kicking themselves, man, because the opportunity was just sitting at their feet, in my opinion. On to Arsenal-Bayern. Uh, again, a really, really good game. Now, this was a game that, like I said, before a ball was kicked, everyone was writing Bayern off because of their form in, in the Bundesliga this season, because of how brilliant Arsenal have been. And look, that's absolutely fair, right? I think Arsenal went into this game deservedly being the favorites. They have been exceptional this season. 
Defensively, I've continuously said it, in my opinion, they're the best defensive team in world football. Their attackers are starting to get form at the right amount of time. I think Odegaard is really playing at a top, top level at the moment. And then you look at Bayern and they're struggling. They have completely self-capitulated in the Bundesliga title race. Leverkusen are a win away from it. Kane is scoring goals, but the rest of the pieces around him really have struggled. Sané, I think, has one goal since October or scoreless since October before tonight. Gnabry, really just out of sorts. Coleman as well. Musiala is doing his thing, but even him, not probably playing at the max capacity we believe he can. Kimmich has been moved to right back. Goretzka is, is uh, a calamity at times. The defense, I mean, Opa Meccano and Kim and Jay, who are their two big money signings, benched for Delict and Dyer. Like, you went into this tie kind of thinking Arsenal playing at the Emirates, completely filled to the brim of Arsenal fans, should walk over Bayern Munich. But the reason I picked Bayern before a ball was even kicked, excuse me, and maybe that was optimistic of me thinking, but regardless, the Champions League, like I said about Real Madrid Man City, is oftentimes decided by individual X factor. And like it or not, as cringe and cliche as this sounds, things like heritage and things like experience and things like know-how matter at this stage in the competition. And that's just something that Bayern has at this stage in their team's window and Arsenal have not built enough of. Now, was that optimistic of me? Perhaps. And within the first what 10 minutes Bukayo Saka kind of showed that look you can you can have all the experience in the world you can have all of the uh, x factor know-how in the world the best players in the world will deliver and I do think I know a lot of people on Twitter are disagreeing with me but I do think Alfonso Davies was really poor in this situation but regardless it's brilliant play from Odegaard it's brilliant play from Ben White and it's expertly taken from Bukayo Saka off that right hand side curling it past a world-class goalkeeper in Manuel Neuer and giving Arsenal a much deserved first goal like a much much deserved lead and I think at that moment people were thinking uh oh Oh, Bayern, like one goal. We've seen you this year in the Bundesliga. You guys tend to capitulate. But to be fair to Bayern, I thought they were really, really smart this game in terms of like how they slowed down the game to their tempo, how they kind of managed the game at times. Like it was expert game management in my opinion. And you look at the, the goal that kind of gets them back into it. Well, no, actually the first goal to be fair was a calamity from, from Arsenal. Let's talk about that. For a team that I've said are the best defensive team in the world, today they did not play like that. And it's just sloppy from from Gabriel, it's sloppy from David Raya, it's maybe a little even lazy from Kivior to kind of stick out a leg, that's up, up to interpretation, maybe the pass was too difficult for him, but I do think if he shifts his body, he gets there, but regardless, it was just sloppy, and those aren't words that you attribute to Arsenal defensively this season, this season you attribute words like no nonsense, rigid, a wall, like it, sloppy is not the word I would think of for those kinds of players, but I mean, it's it's again a, a really well taken goal from, from Bayern, Goretzka is kind of slips in Gnabry, who I think he puts it through David Raya's legs like it was just one of those moments from Arsenal where I thought they were in so much control and then one moment of madness and one moment of maybe lapse of concentration from Arsenal's back line lets Bayern back into the game and that's the last thing you want to do in these kinds of European games is let teams like Bayern Munich back into the equation and from there Bayern I think kind of got their swagger back a little bit to be honest with you man and then even the penalty that they get Leroy Sané cuts one cuts two Jorginho maybe should have taken should have taken him down earlier Saliba kind of collides legs with him. So, uh, Sané goes down. It's a penalty for, for Bayern. And you know Harry Kane, penalty against Arsenal, that's cash money, man. That's cash money. Like, that is what Harry Kane does. Put penalties past Arsenal Football Club at the Emirates. So it was another one. It almost felt like, wow, like, you just kind of... If you're a betting man, you should have put money on, on Harry Kane scoring a penalty against Arsenal. Like, that's it's death taxes and debt. And to be honest with you, that first half, Arsenal didn't close it out well. Because Bayern could have gotten a third. Musiala on the half turn, kind of plays in behind Leroy Sané. Leroy Sané has acres of space to run into. And this is maybe where Leroy Sané, the injuries have kind of caught up to him. Because I think at Manchester City, he gets to this ball and he he's too fast for everybody and he scores past David Raya. Give credit to, to, to Arsenal because I think their recovery defense was really good. Ben White coming back, sprinting back, Kivior, like they did really well to catch up to him and to slow him down. But I think Leroy Sané at his best finishes that. I think he does bury that. And 3-1 up at halftime at the Emirates. Arsenal would have been in massive trouble. Massive, massive trouble. But give credit to them in the second half. I thought they came out a much changed team. And I was even saying it at halftime when I was on SDS, right? This is where Arsenal have the chance to kind of turn the doubters into believers. And I know Bayern, like a lot of people didn't give them credit. But for me, them beating Bayern is a massive, massive uh, green flag. Like that, that is a huge scalp to claim in Europe. No matter what kind of form they are, beating Bayern Munich in Europe is a massive, massive accomplishment. And Again, I want to give credit to them. I think when Jesus came on, he completely changed the game. That's two games in a row, by the way, where Jesus and Trossard make impact in Europe. Trossard obviously started against Porto. Today was Martinelli, who I think had another poor game, but that's a, a, a topic for another day. But Jesus came on against Porto, in my opinion, changed the game. 
today came on against Bayern and changed the game. And he just has, in my opinion, what a few Arsenal attackers maybe lack. And that's X factor. That's this individual quality to no matter what the system is, is saying, no matter what the defense in front of you is kind of dictating you to do, the individual ability to kind of shift defenses and create a moment of individual brilliance all by yourself. Forget the system, forget the coach, forget your teammates, forget the defense in front of you. You're so good and you're so creative that you can make a moment happen just like that. And that's what he did. He put it on a plate for Trussard. Shimmy's past one, Shimmy's past two. Trussard has the easiest job in the world, slotting it past Manuel Neuer and Arsenal back in the game. And I think both teams from that point on, it was kind of chess match-ish. Like obviously it was so good, it played at a really good intensity, but I feel like both teams were kind of afraid to kind of make that final leap forward to kind of like push the men forward. I think Bayern at that point were happy with a 2-2. Arsenal were obviously looking to win the game more so than Bayern, but I think also they were apprehensive of being hit on the counter, which Bayern showed all night they're capable of doing that. But it's funny because actually after that Trossard goal, the, the best chance of the game came to Bayern Munich. Again, Musiala on that left-hand side. Jinkies, Jinkies plays it into the box, the Coleman who side foots it through the legs of David Raya and it's the width of the post away from being 3-2 to Bayern. And I think, look, the game was closing out and we believed that, okay, this is going back to the Allianz, 2-2. Before the moment of madness that has Twitter.com in a frenzy. Loose ball, uh, I don't even know who it was. Was it Dyer? Was it one of them? To kind of allow Bukayo Saka one last chance to finish the game. And this is the moment that everyone has been debating for the last 12 hours. Did Saka dive? Did Neuer make contact? Should Saka have even avoided Neuer and scored anyways? That's the main conversation. In my opinion, I think Bukayo Saka slightly exaggerated the contact. I'm not going to say he dived, but I think it's smart from him or it's cheeky from him because I've seen this from Pires in the past. Ashley Young, in my opinion, was the best at this. Vardy as well too. You kind of leave the, the right leg lazily out you extend it a bit to kind of create contact a little bit and in my opinion it's not a penalty I thought at the time maybe he could have been booked for simulation but I don't think so because I think there was a little bit of doubt at the time like Neuer did make contact but Neuer didn't initiate the contact I think Saka initiates the contact by kind of extending his right leg out and I look I see a lot of people upset about the fact that people are calling that out you guys need to I don't know come back to reality. I, look, I understand Twitter is a cesspool of negativity and I get that on Twitter, people act like it's like a propaganda tool to like boost your favorite players as if it's like a presidential campaign. But sometimes, guys, some of the stuff that I've been seeing the last 12 hours, not just from Arsenal fans, but from all parties, you guys all need to just realize that it's just football at the end of the day. Honestly, some crazy opinions and crazy takes and crazy like outrage that I'm seeing from all parties included. It wasn't a penalty in my opinion. I mean, Thomas Tuchel was arguing for a penalty on, on Bayern's end. I, I do agree with Jamie Carragher who said that that's a harsh penalty to give at this, at this level. Like realistically, we should be awarding penalties for things that really stop the other team from scoring. In my opinion, it's it's a, a, a lack of communication. And if, if my team conceded that kind of penalty, I'd be outraged. I didn't think the Saka penalty was outraged either. But look, it's football, man. Honestly, it's really, really not that deep. We go to the second leg, Bayern versus Arsenal. And I'll tell you what, that game is going to be blockbuster. And I know a lot of people now have kind of written Arsenal off. Oh, you missed your opportunity. Oh, you're going back to the Allianz. Relax relax. The tie is still firmly in the balance. Bayern are fully capable of losing at the Allianz Arena. They're fully capable of, of capitulating. Now, I'm going to stick with my original prediction, and that's Bayern progress. But I'm not that confident. I think this tie could go either way. And one thing that'll be interesting is now Bayern will have more of an initiative and more of an incentive and more pressure on their own fans to kind of lead from the front foot. And they have to be the protagonists of the game. And that maybe allows Arsenal, who Owen Hargreaves said it very well. They are capable of beating you and playing well in multiple styles of play. Transition, counterattack, playing a deep block, playing on the front foot, possession, beat you by set pieces. They can beat you by different ways. And they'll be more than comfortable, in my opinion, if Bayern want to take the game to them. Arsenal just want to soak up pressure because their defense is really good and just hit you with these mean counterattacks. So it'll be a good second leg in both ties. I'm honestly super excited. But look, I think yesterday, just to wrap this up, really made me happy, man. Because I think the last few years, the Champions League has kind of lost its allure for me. And it's not even because United are bad. United have been bad for the last 10 years. And there have been good Champions League campaigns before this one. But I think last year in particular, it was great for City fans. But I think there were a lot of Champions League ties that for me personally fell flat. Yesterday, I predicted it before the games happened. I said they were going to... They, they gave the air. You had the feeling that... We were in for a vintage Champions League night, a vintage European night. And I think both those games lived up to the billing. And personally, I can't wait for the second leg. But tonight, it will be PSG versus Barcelona. It will be Atletico versus Dortmund. I do expect PSG and Atletico to progress, both of them. 
But it'll be interesting, man. It'll be very, very interesting. And one thing I can confidently say about this year's Champions League, last year, I thought City were winning it from the first time a ball was kicked. This year, I truly believe, guys, this Champions League is open for anyone to win it. I think this is the one of the most unpredictable and like out there for anyone to win Champions League I can remember in a long time. So guys, this is the cha this is the channel, excuse me, to be on if you guys want to kind of be up to date with my opinions, my thoughts, uh, my takes. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you like, share, comment. Who do you think is winning tonight? Atletico versus Dortmund, uh, Barca versus PSG. Was it a penalty on Saka? Yes or no? And do Real Madrid still have a chance going to the Etihad? With that being said, it's been your boy Lies, and I'll see you when I see you. Peace.